All right, welcome back to uh, the part four of um, of the um, the lecture. So this part, we're going to talk about this algorithm called random Fourier feature. So random Fourier feature, um, um, what does it do? So previously, we talked about how essentially you can do the feature map, which is based on the basis functions. Right. And using Mercer's theorem, we could also use eigenfunctions. Random Fourier feature basically allows you to generate randomly yet another set. Random. Of basis functions. And somehow they are when you take the inner product, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have said equal. It's more like when you take the inner product, so kernel x and y is end up uh, equal to phi x transpose transpose phi y. So, so essentially, if you use any one of these, any one of these, your kernel, the inner product will still be the same. What I, I shouldn't have put equality. So basically, they're just different bases which allows you to create the identical kernel function. Okay, so so anyways, um, so how are these generated? Okay, so what you need to know is, what you need to know is essentially this thing called the Bachner's theorem. Well, actually, you don't really need to know the Bachner theorem because it's kind of complicated. What you need to know is that for certain kernels, so in this example, we have a Gaussian kernel, right? The Gaussian kernel looks something like this, e to the minus xi minus xj squared to sigma squared. So kxi xj is equal to this. What they found is that kxi is j, xj has a sec another way of representing it. The Gaussian kernel can also be represented by this integral. So that's that's basically the conclusion that came out of Bachner's theorem. And um, hopefully you've taken the classes on how to generate samples to approximate integral. So like over here, for example, you can ascend whenever you have an integral that is uh, has a function and some probability right distribution if you were to generate the sample here then the integral is approximately equal to the samples you plug into f and once you plug this in average them together you would essentially approximate the integral so here they're saying that the kernel function is equivalent to integral which from what we just saw because this is p of w, and we have this as f of w. We can essentially approximate this integral as well by generating samples from p of w. Okay, so we want to generate those samples. Therefore, when we take uh, generate the samples and plug it in here, which is this portion, this is f of w, we plug it in and take the average. This is approximately the same as the kernel. So the idea is that you can essentially generate a bunch of random features. And then when you add them together, you will essentially uh, add up to the same kernel. So this is the multiplication of, you can imagine, x and y, x, i, y, y. Therefore, it's equivalent to the summation of x1, y1, plus x2, y2, so on and so forth. And this is equivalent to x1, x2, x3, y1, y2, right? So this is equal to x transpose y. So you can see, since we're multiplying all these together and summing it up, another way to write this exact same expression is you just write them from this part and then write them from this part. 
right? Well, notice how when you multiply them together, it's equivalent to this. And from here, you can see that this kernel, essentially, we can use these as the feature maps, like as the basis function of the feature map, right? And if we use these as the basis function, then, then um, we will get the kernel back. So, so essentially, we can let these be the base, new basis functions. And the way we would get them is we would just randomly generate uh, samples from a Gaussian distribution, center at zero uh, with a standard deviation of one. So if we generate them randomly, every time we do it, then we will have W1, W2, WM, right? So note the one, one caveat here is X is a D dimension, D dimension. So W also, you have to be D dimension. So you have to generate D numbers of W, right? W1, W2, right? So each one of them comes from a Gaussian distribution of, of a, a standard deviation of one. And the B here, the B here is, is a, a phase, and you will generate with a normal distribution. I don't mean normal, uniform, uniform between zero and two pi. Okay? So you generate two pi, a distribution. So you just generate these, and you have the feature map. Like right? that's basically it. Okay. So. So that's that's it. Actually, random Fourier feature is pretty easy. The complicated part is understanding Bachmann's theorem. But you don't really know it. You don't really need to know it to really use it. You just need to know that essentially a kernel can be approximated with the integral, and with the integral you can essentially uh, break and break them down into features. Okay. So now I just told you we can write well instead of phi, we're going to write phi tilde. Tilde. So we now have a new set of feature maps, um, a basis function, sorry. We have a new set of basis functions, and these basis functions are essentially these. So every time you generate a random W, you plug it in, another one you plug it in, another one you plug it in, right? So and you, you generate uniform distribution between 0 and 2 pi. You plug it in, plug it in, plug it in. And now you have to, you have, this is it. This is your feature, uh, feature map. So, so this feature map, we can simplify because this is the same. So we can pull this outside here and then cosine is the same. So we're running cosine. Uh, we can pull cosine outside as well. And notice here, X is the same. So we can pull X out. So X times W1, W2, W3 and B, we can pull that out too. So w, you notice how this multiply this plus this is equivalent to this. So, well, I'm going to call this the W, like capital W, and then I'm going to call this B. So we now have a really, really simple uh, equation. So the equation for the feature map is equal to this, right? So you need to generate a bunch of W, a bunch of B, and, and that's it. And now, now you have the feature map. Now, for the phi, capital phi, um, then we need to plug every single sample, x1, x2, xn, in there. So what is the feature map for each one of these? Well, it's for x1, x2, right? So this is the feature map, and we plug it in to each and every one of them. So now we can use the same trick again. Notice how this is the same, and cosine is the same. So we pull them out. Notice how w is the same. And so we can pull w out again. After we pull w, this right here is just the X matrix, and we're going to call this the capital B matrix. Therefore, here we have it. So, so now this right here will give us the capital Phi. Okay? So the random Fourier feature basically says we need to generate M by D random number from a normal distribution, center zero, standard deviation one, uh, center zero, one, and we need to generate a uniform distribution between 0 and 2 pi as B, right? Once you have B, you notice how we made multiple copies of B. So we need to uh, make multiple copies to create the capital B. And once we have 
W and B, right? We have the phi matrix. And that's it. That's that's the random Fourier feature. I wrote the code here. You want to maybe pause the video and see. And notice how um, the, my random Fourier feature, this is the kernel. This is the actual kernel. And when I ran my random Fourier feature, notice how the numbers are pretty close. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's an approximation of it. And it does a pretty reasonable job, right? Okay, so you can um, you can just write uh, the code yourself. SKLearn also comes with a library, so I think it's called the RBF sampler. Is that what it is? Yes, yes, yeah. I think this is this one is it. So you can also use the random Fourier feature directly from the SKLearn. Okay, All right. So. Um, at this point, um, why do why why is random Fourier feature so interesting? Okay, let's take a step back and say that so far we've worked for this semester. We've worked a lot with regression problems, and with regression, ultimately we're trying to solve a problem that looks like this. You're trying to find a function, right, such that your prediction, your function output prediction, and the truth. Their difference is what we call the error. We're trying to find a function that makes the error as small as possible. That, that's essentially what we're doing. And at this point, now that you understand more kernels, this function using the reproducing property essentially looks like this. And we are really finding this vector here, right? This vector. And what is really special with doing it using the reproducing property Right by using the reproducing property, it implies that the closed form solution um, could 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 be achieved. And having this closed form solution, at this point, you've worked with the gradient descent, and you have worked with the closed form closed form solution. Right, I th I think we can all agree that having the closed form solution is the way to go because it gives you the optimal solution, and it gives you the optimal solution. And you don't have to run gradient descent over and over again. You get the solution directly. So having the closed form solution is really, really special. So, so what happened is modern day, modern neural network end up using an alternative way to represent this function where they don't use the reproducing property. And without the reproducing property, you can no longer do the closed form solution. Right, and this is why the modern day neural network still trying to solve the same problem, still trying to solve, but, but instead of trying to solve the same problem, they end up not using reproducing property and they have a different structure. And as a result, this is why gradient descent is the standard optimizer when, when we do modern neural network, right? So, so you can agree that you you gain you gain a lot of power by using this other structure, but you lose a lot by not having the closed form solution anymore, right? So so even though the closed form solution we can agree is superior, so since neural network forms the foundation of machine learning, it would be really great if we can find a closed form solution regardless of the fact that we are no longer using um, the reproducing property. So for a long time, we were not sure whether a closed form solution is possible, is feasible, or even theoretical, theoretically possible. So in 2022, right, it was really cool that um, it was discovered that if we use random Fourier feature, yeah, exactly, the one that we just learned here, random Fourier feature, as the activation function. So modern neural network used ReLU, but what was discovered is that if you use random Fourier feature instead, you can, the closed form solution is then theoretically possible. Indeed, they actually found out what the closed form solution is. Okay, So um, according to a paper written by this guy named Che Wu and R.A. Masumi, so they were able to discover, um, they were able to discover that if you use random Fourier feature, assuming like the one they use is the Gaussian, Gauss for the Gaussian kernel. So if you use a random Fourier feature, so in each network has the weights and the activations. So these are the weights, these are the 
activation, right? So instead of ReLU, they use random Fourier feature here, here, right, for the activation. And if you use that, then the, there exists a closed form solution for W, right? And in fact, the W, uh, the weights are really, really easy to calculate with a closed form solution, right? So what they said is given an appropriate Gaussian random for a feature, you need to pick the appropriate like sigma value in there. But assuming that you did, the closed form solution for the weights for each layer is just the kernel mean embedding of all the samples from the previous layer. So you can imagine that if you treat all the samples here, right, for this layer, you pass it through, you pass it through here as if it's a feature map. And the weights here is simply the kernel mean embedding. And that's it. That is an, kernel mean embedding, um, I think we're going to go over that in a later lecture. So currently, you don't know, know what kernel mean embedding is. But uh, once we get to the kernel mean embedding, then you'll see that it's the weights are actually really easy to calculate. And the way this network, they were able to show how this network works. The way it works is very similar to LDA. Right? We did LDA previously, where you know that LDA tries to push samples of um, different classes as far apart as possible, right? And it tries to make all the samples clump together really closely. So what they discover is that you can, you can incrementally push the samples this way through each layer. It's kind of like you're doing, kind of like you're doing LDA over and over again. So over here, they generated completely random samples, complete random sample. And even this random sample where you can see how the samples at the initial layer is completely mixed together. And then as they go to the next layer, next layer, next layer, notice how at the ninth layer, they were able to create a linearly separable representation. So all the green all the green crosses and the circles are separated. And observe how they continue to push them further and further apart until eventually they were able to push them as far apart as possible and all the samples are basically on top of each other. So what is really cool is basically they, they discover that by using this, this closed form solution, they, they're guaranteed to reach the global optimum, global optimum for the training, you know, for the training data. So this is extremely powerful. And you can see here, even for completely random, there's no pattern here. They were able to, they were able to push it, you know, to the global optimum. The, they also ran another experiment called the adversarial. And the way it worked is that they purposely put the samples that are different classes, really close to each other. And then the samples that really, that should be in the same class, like circle and circle, they put them far away. So therefore that's, that's contradictory, right? Normally you want samples in the same class to be close together. So that's why they call it adversarial. And, and in the adversarial experiment, notice how they were able to create linearly separable representation. Like notice how, how everything was packed together. And by the fifth layer, they were able to generate a linearly separable representation. And by the 12th layer, they achieved the global optimal. So, so and all of these is basically based on the idea of using random Fourier feature instead of rally. And that's why, you know, random Fourier feature is actually pretty cool. Okay. So for today, I want you to practice, practice random Fourier feature, uh, what I want you to do is essentially generate the Gaussian kernel using sklearn, and then you can use Nystrom and random Fourier feature to see if you can generate the exact same kernel. Okay, so that's it. I think that's it for the ran Nystrom and random Fourier feature series. We'll move on to a different topic in a, in a future lecture.